Hallelujah. Give it up for Jesus. Give it up. There's power in the room right now. There's power in the room right now. Give it up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have your seat. Have your seat. Good morning, HCC. How are we doing today? I need some more energy in the room. How are we doing? Yes. There's power in the room today. My name is Sam Coupon, and I have the absolute pleasure of serving this house as your next steps director. And this is my amazing queen. Carissa. Carissa. What do you have for us, Carissa? Um, we just wanted to let you know we're so, so uh, excited and happy and thankful that you guys are here worshiping with us, learning with us. Um, and we would love to connect with you, get to know you. Um, there's a connect card in the seat back in front of you that you can fill out. There's some different things on there that we would absolutely love to know about you. Um, if you have a decision that you made today or if you have a prayer request, you can put that in there. And then um, you can take it to the Connect Center at the back of the church through those doors on your way out. All right. Thank you. You can also put that in an offering uh, as it gets past you today. Um, now, part of the reason why we have this Connect card is here at ACC, our goal is to try to get you out of the crowd into the community of, of, of God's people. Right. So when we say we want to connect with you, we just want to do life with you. We want to do community with you. We want to be able to share with you, cry with you, laugh with you, as the church in the olden days used to do. Yeah? So please fill those up. Uh, how many of you here, actually, I'm not going to ask that. We have an amazing um, children ministry. And uh, oh, last summer, we had this amazing VBS program. And it's sports theme based, right? So this year, we want to invite you to bring your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, bring them and sign up for our sports camp. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing VBS. It's an amazing time. We here, we believe in the next generation. We believe that we need to work to bring these young ones up into the kingdom of God. And one of the best ways to do that is to make sure they have something to do this summer. Make sure that there's God-appointed people to look over them to do some amazing sports we have we have you know i think we have basketball we have football we have i think we have volleyball we have cheerleading so it's going to be an amazing and it's all free i think it's amazing right so if you want free babysitting from eight from five to eight on july 8th to the 11th bring them over you can sign up in the back we also have these flyers you can take with you you can give it to your neighbors, give it to your friends, give it to your, you know, the store that you go to. Now, we all have those coffee shop. We go to, everybody knows our name. Just drop that in there, and it will be an amazing time. I also want to share with you that uh, one of the most amazing ways that you can be part of a community of believers is to get baptized. Right, so we have a, a baptism experience coming up on July 21st, and we would love for you to be up here and get dunked and get baptized in the name of Jesus. So July 21st is the experience. The week before that, July 14th, we're going to have a, like a short, maybe 30, 45 minute class to kind of get you to know what baptism is, what are the logistics. So July 14th, there's a class downstairs, and then July 21st we're going to do an amazing baptism experience. Yeah? How are we feeling about that? That is awesome. Thank you so much for being here. And for those of you online, we appreciate you being here. We love that you are part of our, of our community. And um, we have an amazing video for you guys. All right.
Awesome. That was so cool. So good morning. My name is Blake, and I had the opportunity to, to lead a group of missionaries, 24 people from our church. Can we give it up? So, so 24 incredible people went from our church, many for the first time on a mission trip. Uh, and it was incredible it was just to see that team take a leap of faith, go to Mexico for a week, um, take off work, and get, be away from their family. So it was a big sacrifice. It's one of the biggest teams we've ever had for missions. So it was really cool to see. And we had a lot of young people, a lot of teenagers. And I just kind of just want to share a report, what we did, how many souls we saw saved. Um, so I'm just going to give you kind of what we did and then our numbers here. So each day we went to a local church in the community um, and we were separated into groups, each of us. And we, so we had a medical group. So we uh, met their needs there. We filled out prescriptions, whatever medicine they need. We did uh, their blood pressure, sugar. Uh, and then we had hair care. So we did some haircuts for the people in the community, uh, and some nails. Then we had a youth and kids ministry. So we played games with the kids. We did some face painting. Um, so that was really cool. Pastor Mark did an incredible job with the kids. Uh, and then we had an optical, so we, um, so we just to see if they need glasses. We do, like, the eye test. So now I'm officially an eye doctor in Mexico. I wrote dozens of prescriptions, so and you can call me Dr. Blake from now on. Um, so I just kind of want to give you the numbers. So in medical, we served 67 people. Uh, we gave 34 haircuts. Uh, we did uh, 37 for nails, and then... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm reading a totally different day. Our numbers are much bigger than that. Hold on one second. So 86 for medical, 55 haircuts, 57 for nails, uh, 99 kids, and we did 313 for optical. Um, so we served a total of 622 people. And get ready for this. This is the big number, so I want you all to go crazy. So we saw... We had 213 total salvations that gave their life to Christ. So it was awesome to see just the team. Um, so each day just to see their faith grow and to see people step out and just pray for people, to lead them to the Lord, to have faith and belief for miracles. The last few days we just saw like everybody on the team finding people, praying and just stepping out in faith. Um, and we saw a few miracles as well. It was incredible. I just want to share a couple of them. So the first day, um, we were in optical, and many people would come, and they would just be blind in one eye, could not see in one eye, so we'd get glasses just for, for one good eye. So we would pray for them and just say, you're going to be healed. We believe you're going to be healed in the name of Jesus. Uh, and there was one lady we got to pray with, uh, and she stood up, and we just put her, we laid our hands on her, and um, we prayed, and I said, is it any better? And she said, I can see light from this eye. And they said, let's pray again. Uh, and then she said the second time, well, I can see silhouettes now. And I said, let's pray again. And then she looked at me. She said, I can see your eyes. And she just started weeping. So it was incredible, incredible. And then our, la our last day, we got to pray for a woman, and she was blind in one eye. Uh, so we prayed, and for, unfortunately, we, she was not healed, but she, um, we had a Google Translate, and she started speaking after we prayed for her. And she said she had severe issues with her spine. She couldn't stand up straight. She couldn't walk very well. She was in severe pain, uh, just an issue with her vertebrae. So we just started praying for her. And we, we gathered around her, had her, her hand on her back, on her spine. And as we were praying, she did this, like, shimmy. I don't know. She was just moving her shoulders. And all of a sudden, we could feel her spine just straighten out. And she was standing up tall. Uh, just beaming with, with the, the biggest smile I've ever seen and just joy. So she was completely healed, spine, no more pain. And she said, I'm still going to go to the doctor just to check it out. But she said, I know um, the doctor of all doctors healed me and the Lord of Lords. So it was incredible, incredible. And I just want to say thank you to this church. You all were awesome in supporting us uh, with your prayers and financially. Um, you were incredible. So thank you, thank you. Uh, and right now, I just want to invite, we got a couple of people on our team I'm going to invite up, and they're going to share their testimony. So right now, I just want to invite Pastor Mark up to the platform. Pastor Mark, there you go. 
You guys hear me? There we go. To God be the glory. Um, listen, we went to Mexico City to serve and to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And we collectively uh, prepared ourselves mentally and emotionally to do what we were going to do. And my part of my responsibility was to make sure that uh, our young people were focused and on task. And let me tell you, Blake shared some of the numbers and some of the things that we did. And for me, to work with our young people in the kids department, there were some life transforming things that I observed for myself. And I'll just share one quick example and I'll get out of the way. A young lady came up to me that went on the mission trip with us and she said, Pastor Mark, this was in the morning as we we're leaving the hotel preparing to go and serve. She says, Pastor Mark, I feel like God is telling me I need to pray for somebody, but I'm just, I'm scared. I said, you know what? God is going to show you who he wants you to pray for. And all you have to do is just pray because God honors the desire of your heart and you desire to pray for somebody. He's going to show you who to pray for and you're going to do that and you're going to bless them. So she's like, okay, okay. So we get there and, and, and halfway through the day, she comes back to me. And she says, Pastor Mark, I, I prayed, but I, I, I think I might have messed up. I said, let me tell you something. I said, I said, I know your, I know your dad. I know your father. He's a great guy. Now, I imagine, can you imagine going and talking to your dad? And, and, and what if you start stuttering or you forget what you're going to say? And, and won't he still love you and listen patiently until you finish what you want to say because he loves you? She's like, yeah, yeah. It's like, that's the same way with our Heavenly Father. You can't mess that up. It's like you're just talking to him. So whatever you say, as long as you're giving him glory, you're speaking to him, he's going to love you, and he's going to listen to what you have to say. So you didn't mess that up. And when you led that young lady to Christ, God heard your prayers. He honors your prayers. And now you are part of the reason why, why another soul is added to the kingdom. And, and now I could see her, the, the, her face just lighten up, and, and I was just grateful to witness the move of God in this experience. And, and so our young people did a wonderful job of just going out, loving, serving, and just being the hands and feet of Jesus this week. Amen. Thank you, Mark. All right, now I'm going to have Jan come up. She's going to share a testimony with us. Hey, Mark. I didn't know I was going to be following the professional talkers here. So um, my first mission trip, it was um, wonderful is all I can say. Um, I was part of the medical team. I've been a, a nurse for many years. Um, but I got to be on the medical team, and we got to, you know, evaluate these, these people. And, you know, we in America have Medicaid for the people that, you know, have low income and they don't have that in Mexico City so we saw a lot of people that just needed prescription for Tylenol for ibuprofen things that um, we take for granted uh, we we ran out of Tylenol so um, just a lot of the things that we take for granted or I take it for granted that we have access to they don't uh, we were passing out medications for you know heart disease diabetes GI issues um, that these people need to survive. So it felt really good to be able to help, help in that way. Um, I got out of my comfort zone a lot because I don't speak in public and I don't pray in public. And um, they called on me to pray one morning <laughs> at the church in front of 50 people. And I think Mark saw my face of horror. I'm like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? So he came over and um, supported me. And then Kathy, I was standing next to Kathy Kiefer and I grabbed her hand. I'm like, just help me get through this. So I survived to tell about it. It was a good experience. <laughs> you know, I was telling, you know, telling the group that, you know, Kara Kiefer, she's always on our prayer team. And I always admire that she can come up here and, and pray with, you know, as you guys need prayer. And I've not had that confidence to do that yet. So that's my goal is to get there. Um, and we were challenged at the beginning of the week to leave the week saying, I'm glad instead of I wish, and um, I'm glad. And I know our group is glad. We, we, a lot of us went out of our comfort zone. The kids were amazing. Um, 
our leaders, all of the adults, we all did everything I believe that we could to make a difference. So I can say with very much confidence that I'm glad. Amen. Amen. Missions, man, that's, that's awesome. It's a wonderful thing that our church is a part of. Uh, we truly reach out to the whole world. It's, our name is Hamilton Christian Center, but our impact lasts so much further than that, right? Um, now, I will tell you if I'm up here and I'm a little jittery, it's probably not the Holy Spirit. We were in the back room this morning. I think a fly hit my head and then went down my shirt. I'm just hoping it wasn't a spider, so just you see some shaking. Honestly, just don't tell me if you see it. I'll just let me get through it. We'll figure it out later, okay? So, whew, all right. Um, I don't know if anybody likes the Olympics. My wife loves it. Um, she's had the Olympic uh, trials going on, you know, just seeing the best of the best in the world compete. There was one guy talking about uh, after he did his race, his brother had raced with him, and he's like, his, his brother didn't place, but he was talking about how crazy awesome it is that his brother, even though he didn't place for America, is one of the top 100 fastest people in the world. Like, how many people can say that, right? So just those stories as athletes, you know, make um, and, and what they do, what they put their bodies through is so awesome. Um, so this actually, as we were watching this, I knew I was doing tithe and offering and knew what was going on with missions. It made me think back to my wife and I's uh, honeymoon right after we got married. We got to go to Paris, which is where the Olympics is going to be this year. And then uh, we got to go to Rome, where the Colosseum is and all these cool things and got to experience that. But my wife is amazing. Every time we go on a trip anywhere, she always plans something that's going to impact our lives, right? Um, last year, we went to Switzerland for our 10-year anniversary. She took us uh, to go see Auschwitz um, over in Poland for one day. Um, but when we were in Rome, she had us go to Mamertine Prison, um, which is where Paul and Peter are said to have been imprisoned, right? So we got to go into this place where Paul was probably sitting there writing Philippians, right? Um, and uh, in Mamertine Prison, they had this display and it was a video presentation It was talking about water because there was this constant dripping. And it's basically this cave that they put a building on top of to make a prison, right? There was a hole in the ground that they would just throw people in. And that's how, that's how they imprisoned them. And, and the guards would stand on the upper floor and there'd just be this drip. And this drip is what they were saying in this video was, you know, talking about the power of water, the power of erosion to make this cave. And they started talking about how it tortured people just hearing this drip. Right, because it would just drive you crazy, just waiting for that next drip. While you don't know, it's you're in a cave. It's dark. You don't know what time's going on. You don't know what's going on with the day, with the night, and then it changes. Paul and Peter in there, that torture, that erosion, that that destruction that's happening in people's life. That's not what they see. They see water to come and baptize people, to change lives, to bring victory where there was only failure. Right, where people were oppressing them and holding them down. They came, and they used that water to bring life and change to the Roman Empire, right? So Philippians has some wonderful scriptures in it. Um, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Got to tie it into the Olympics, pressing on, right? Okay, uh, you've got peace that passes all understanding, to live as Christ, to die as gain, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right. Well, a lot of times we use I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me in support of our athletics and support of struggles in our lives and things like that. Well, when we actually read it, I'm going to go a little bit before it. OK, Philippians 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in wants, I can do all this through him who gives me strength, right? He continues to go on talking about how the Philippians were the church, the first church that really was supporting him. When he went out to Macedonia, they were the one church that actually gave to him and giving and receiving. Um, for even when I was in Thessalonica, 
You sent, more, uh, sent me aid more than once when I, when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that you be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Ephroditus the gift that you sent. Right? So he is feeling the support and love. You know, th these people in the Philippians, they have their church. They're tithing to their church. They're giving to their people. But then they gave above, right? They went and gave an offering, not just their tithe. So what can we do as a church here? We just sent people out, right? We just sent people out into the world. We are that church. We are people right now supporting Paul's, right? We are supporting the next generation here at Hamilton Christian Center. We are supporting the world here. We are making a difference. So right now, I just want to pray for you guys. Do our tithe and offering. But thank you for being a church of gifts, not just to this house. everybody. I'm Pastor Curtis. I'm the lead pastor here at HCC, and it is truly an honor and a privilege to be with you today. I'm really excited to present someone that has just been a dear, dear friend of mine. He and his wife, Lexi, are here today, and uh, we have known each other for around 15 years. First met when he launched a church in Charleston, South Carolina, and then many years later, through David Pepper and knowing that we both knew him uh, and also Marty and Sean. We continued to grow in a relationship to where I found out he kind of had a coaching network and a consultation for pastors. Then he joined an organization called ARC. That's where he launched his church from. And within ARC, they recognized his gift to mentor other pastors. And I became one of those individuals. And last week, Jason Dorn was one of those pastors as well. And we've been a part of a network now for around three years where we meet every month virtually and just encourage each other. Jeff always brings a word and coaches us. He's truly an incredible communicator and a great teacher. And I'm so honored that my dear friend Jeff Centers is here with us today. Can you please give a warm welcome as he joins us on the platform here? Good morning. Good morning, Hamilton. How you doing this morning? Everybody good? Good to see you this morning. Good to be here. Uh, I do want to start out by honoring uh, my wife, who's here with me today, my, my, the, my first lady. Uh, Miss Lexi is here today with us. And, uh, and I also want to honor Pastor Curtis and Pastor uh, Johnny Wade Sloan back there as well. Could you all appreciate your pastors here? Don't, aren't they great? Fantastic. Mm, thank you so much. Uh, it is great to be here with you. It's great to be back here with you. I was here on a Wednesday night a few years ago, and uh, just, you know, what I have seen in Curtis personally over the years that I've known him, and he is so uh, coachable. Uh, he has a heart to be honest and to be transparent, and that is what will carry him and sustain him in the long run, because this thing is not easy. Amen. How I many of you know it's just not easy being a Christian, let alone being on the front lines 
uh, but it's so great to hear and to see and to come back and to see just, you know, changes you're making and new faces and new people on the team and to see missions going forth. I believe that's the, I, I call that the, uh, I, I, I refer to it as the third baptism, amen, Jesus, Holy Ghost, and missions, come on, right? So it is, it is a baptism of its own, and, and, and some of you that went on that trip, uh, you know what I'm talking about, and for those of you that uh, have yet to do that, I encourage you to do that. And it is so important. Uh, while, uh, you know, he talked about giving, I, I like to think of it like this. You don't give to your church, you give through your church. You give through it, you really do. And you get to see that expression even in another country uh, with uh, so many people going and doing that today. Uh, like Pastor Curtis said, just a little bit about me. Uh, I am from, originally from down in the mountains of East Kentucky. I know this is not broken Australian you're here, and this is actually Appalachian. Uh, I'm, I'm from down a town uh, where some of probably your ancestors migrated up here from, a town called Hazard, Kentucky. I'm from not too far. Shout out. Come on, Hazard, today. Uh, <laughs> I'm from close to there, uh, but uh, I, we live now on our farm in uh, Bath County, and uh, we moved to Charleston in 2013, planted a church down there. It went amazing, uh, just, uh, just incredible what God did through that. And uh, I was actually back there last weekend uh, speaking down there. They're doing great. Moved into a new building before we left, and uh, God's doing just so many great things through that. But we felt the call to, uh, after we bought this shopping center and moved into it, and after we'd been there about a year, God began to deal with me about passing the torch. And uh, there's no drama, everything was great, but uh, God just said, what, what I've wired you to do, your assignment here is over. And uh, so we found a great couple and raised them up, and uh, they're actually coming to hang out with us next weekend. I serve as an overseer for them now, and I help churches and pastors stay faithful and be fruitful in what God has called them to do. And I'm so thankful right now. I'm a very blessed man. I, have a, I brought a picture of my family. I don't know if they could show that up there, but at my wife and uh, my two children there, my, they're both down in Lexington, Kentucky. My son just graduated from UK, and my daughter is getting married next month, actually in a couple of weeks. Y'all pray for your boy up here. Some of you know what that's like, uh, but uh, we're, we're thankful for her. And then I think I brought another picture of the rest of my family. I don't know if they get that up there or not, but um, the whole family. There, there's the rest of the gang right there. Yeah. yeah, it's my jam right there. Family group photo right there. That's my new congregation, y'all. That's my new sheep right there. So I'm one blessed man today. But it's good that you're here because this city needs you. This community needs you. We need healthy churches everywhere, but it's so important. Never take for granted what's happening. Never take for granted just coming to church. It's important that you're here because this city needs you. And God, I, I, how many of you remember uh, uh, the saying, if I said this, some of you will notice this, uh, uh, God is good and all the time. I love you 90s Christians, where y'all at today? I love y'all. Come on, somebody, love y'all. Thank God for y'all. But isn't it true today? I mean, isn't God good? I mean, can we just stop right there and just say, isn't God good? Isn't he good? He's just good. God, we thank you that you're just so good. And that's what I want to talk to you about for just a few minutes today, just about the goodness of God. But not only the goodness of God, but about finishing well. About finishing well. And some of you are like, well, I'm, what do I need? I'm finishing. I'm just getting started, right? But trust me, someday this will be the most important thing in your life. And it might be that you're just wherever you are, you need to finish well there. I'm not talking about maybe finishing like dying, you know, like life is over, finishing my race. But just maybe where you are, the season you're in, maybe the place you're in, wherever that might be. But God just wants you to finish well as a, as a testimony and a witness. Wherever you are, he wants you to finish well. I mean, we would say amen to that today. But, you know, sometimes we talk about the goodness of God. Sometimes it's a little tough to see that, isn't it? It's a little tough to see the goodness of God. I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm a farmer now, right? So weather is a big deal to me. It matters. 
And so what that means is I have to watch the nightly news because I like watching the weather, right? I, I'm there, 6 o'clock, dialed in every night. I got I to gotta find out what's going on. But I, the other night I was just trying to watch the news, and it's not news anymore. Have y'all noticed that? It's not news. It's the nightly crime report is what it is. It's so discouraging, isn't it? Just to try to watch what's going on and you walk away feeling like just so discouraged. It seems like there's evil everywhere. It just seems like bad things are happening everywhere. There's tragedies happening everywhere. And you really feel the tension between good and evil sometimes, don't we? It, and it really blurs and blinds us to the good things that are happening around us, the goodness of God. You know, there's a lot of people right now that, especially I think in this younger generation and a lot of young adults, and uh, they're, they are asking a lot of uh, questions, and they're good questions, but they're looking around going, if, if God is good, then why is there so much suffering in the world? If God is really good, how could he allow all this? Like, if God is really good, would he really send people to hell? Like, if God is good, why are there so many problems in the world? It doesn't seem to be good down here. What's going on? Can I help you with that for just a second? I, I've had to learn this uh, myself. You know, usually um, it's not God's fault, by the way. Usually... All the problems, all the evil, everything that you can associate with negativity or darkness in this world, it's usually one of three reasons. It's usually, number one, because of our choices. Growing up, you probably heard, you know, you pro my dad used to leave. Every time I would leave my dad, he would always say, be good now, be good. How many of you failed in that endeavor growing up? I'm a, any, uh, any, uh, any uh, people that had to learn from experience, it's not easy to always be good growing up. Any wooden spoon survivors out there? Fly swat? Hairbrush? Sh house shoe? Whatever mama could grab hold of, right? Is what, oh, I, don't talk to me about time out. I know, don't, don't get mad at me. But sometimes we learn like choices matter, right? Our choices have consequences. It's usually our choices. Number two, it's usually, if not our choices, the choices of others. Never mistake that your choices matter. They cast a shadow on people around us. Or maybe it's just number three, if it's not our choices or somebody else's, and this really ties back into the first two, it's just that we live in a fallen, broken world. Usually one of those three reasons is the reason why we see the problems, the evil, the suffering all around us. But look what David said in Psalm 23, one of the, maybe the most popular psalm. David said this, he said, Yea, though I walk through, amen, and you might be there today, but I just came to declare over somebody, you're going to go through it. You're going to walk through it. He said, but... If I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he said, watch this, I still will fear no evil. It might be chaos and hell and evil and darkness all around me, but I will not be afraid of it. He said, why? Because you are with me. Come on, somebody, for God is with me. I'm not going to let what's external become internal. I'm not going to fear the evil around me. He said, your rod and your staff, they come for me. This is a little shepherd nod. This is a little shepherd term here. And as a shepherd now, I can tell you that every now and then when we're working the sheep, when we got to get them where, I usually will got to get me a little stick and got to get behind them. Usually what works better is a bag of corn in front of them to lead them. But sometimes if I'm driving them somewhere, I get me a little stick and I'll just tap them a little bit just to remind them which way they need to go. God sometimes has to remind us which way to go, but David took comfort in knowing that God's going to guide me. And sometimes that little tap reminds me that he's there. Come on, somebody. He reminds me that he's there. He said, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies, that you're going to provide for me even in the midst of attacks and spiritual warfare. You will anoint my head with oil. God, you're going to help me to think right. God, you're going to help me to be healed when I need to be healed in my thinking. 
my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Would you say all with me? He didn't say that, that it's going to be good Tuesday and Thursday, that, that mercy and, and goodness would be there just every other week. He said, no, it's going to follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Say it with me, forever. You know what? And that's not just when we get to heaven. That starts right now. That I'm going to dwell in God's presence starting now and ultimately forever. But you might have to... Sometimes remind yourself that he's with you because sometimes we don't feel it, do we? Steve Cuss uh, wrote a book recently about this, and he said that usually our difficulty lies in the gap that we feel between what we believe and what we experience. He said usually our faith and our discouragement comes when we usually fall into the gap in one of three years that we believe God is with us, but we just don't feel it. We know God loves us, but we just don't see it. Or number three, you just might be discouraged because you just thought I'd, thought I'd be further along than I am right now. I thought I'd be able to not have to fight this battle all the time. I thought I would outgrow that. I thought that I would not have to deal with this anymore. Well, I promise you there is victory, and we are overcomers, but sometimes it might take a minute. Come on, somebody. You might have to fight battles that take years or even decades, but what you can never forget is that God is with you to the end. To the end. Even in Jesus' last words, he told his disciples, go make disciples of all nations, teach them, baptize them. He said, and I am with you to the end of the age. Promise he'd be there to the very bitter end. But I've noticed this, and I've lived this. Sometimes we have the faith, don't we, to go do something for God, but we lose faith once we get there. It gets hard. It starts to get uphill. The devil will see to it that you have difficulty. When you step out in faith, you're going to face headwinds of opposition from the enemy. And I've learned this, if anything, that farming is a little bit like ministry. you got to love it or you'll quit. <laughs> Some days when you're out there and it's hot and it's smelly and it's hard and it's raining or it's not raining or whatever it is, you got to remember that God is with me. David said this in Psalm 27, I would have lost heart. He said, I would have quit. I would have given up unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord someday when I get to heaven. No, that's not what it says, is it? He said, I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. I'm talking about right here, right now. The goodness of God. It's still there, it's still near, and we can never forget that He is with us, inside us, around us, empowering us. You know, I've often said this, I, the, and the Bible speaks to this, it says, don't throw away your confidence. I see even Christians losing confidence. You know what I believe? I believe we ought to be the most confident people in the world. Not confident in ourselves, but confident in our God. Confident in the Lord that His plans will come to fruition for us. You know, and what that means for us? It means this, that we ought to be able to finish well. We ought to be able to run our race, and we ought to be able to finish well. Let me give you an example, if I could, of the goodness of God and God's nature, God's redemptive goodness. It comes from Romans 8, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. If you're a, a new Christian, I would encourage you to read, uh, start in, in the book of John and read Romans chapter 8. That's where I tell you probably to go. Romans chapter 8 says this, starting in verse 28. says, we know that in all things God works for the good, those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Don't we love that verse right there? But you got to keep reading to see really how God does that, right? 
at how we got here. He says, for those God foreknew, that means God knows in advance everything that's going to happen. I hate to tell you, but God already knows. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything. Nothing will surprise him. He knows everything that's going to happen. Well, Jeff, why are we here? What's it matter? Is it all, you know, just planned out? And does nothing we uh, matter? Does nothing we do have any influence? Does, why? What's the point? Well, God might know, but you and I don't. We don't know who's going to accept Jesus, do we? We don't know who to pray for. We don't know. God might, but we don't. So that's why we do what we do. But he said, he, those he foreknew, and I love to think of it, he not only foreknew me, he foreloved me. That means that we have a destiny. That we're predestined to be conformed to his image. Hallelujah. That he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Jesus started really the family of God with the new covenant in that regard. It says he foreknew us and that we have a destiny, but before we can have a destiny, we have to be first called. So he called you. Let me remind you today, if you're a little discouraged, you're called. You're called, and you do have a destiny. And those he called, he also justified. This comes from really the heart of the gospel in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where it says that, For he who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. That Jesus, when he was on the cross, even though he never sinned, he was holy, perfect, and blameless, he took upon our sin that we might have righteousness through him. That's the heart of the gospel. That we are now justified. And he said, those he justified, he also glorified, that Jesus is the glory of God. And if Jesus is on the inside of you, then you are living in and walking in the glory of God. And that someday, yes, we will go to heaven, and someday we will receive a crown of glory, one of the five crowns mentioned in the Bible. But that crown is not for me. I'm going to take that crown, and I'm going to lay it at Jesus' feet. <laughs> But down here sometimes, my crown gets a little sideways. I need my crown, get, I need somebody to help adjust my crown sometimes. I forget that I am royalty. You know what? This, this, this is called by, in sort of theological circles, if you will, this, these verses are called this. They're called God's chain of redemption. This is what's called God's glorious chain of redemption, God's redemptive plan and purpose for His people. Aren't you glad to know that God has a plan for us? God has a one thing that leads to, say it, another. But did you know that your life has sort of a chain too? God has a plan. God has a chain of events. But our life is sort of like this in a way, isn't it? Also, you might call it a chain of events, a chain of circumstances. I like to think of it as a chain of, of choices. You know, I, 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 one, one link sort of leads to another, and we can, we can sort of add to the chain of events of our life by our choices. By faith, we can add links to it, or by fear. That you can see how they, they link together. And I was talking to my wife about this. You know, sometimes we have an event that happens that's unfortunate. We have a chain, we have an event that adds sort of a link in our life where somebody didn't exactly treat us like we wanted to be treated. See, that's what I think part of the darkness and the problem is in this world. We have a, this guy that we know, and he has struggled throughout his whole life. 
And, and his most recent stunt was this. He got in trouble with the law again, and he owns some property next to a lady that works in the courthouse, and he believes that this lady said something to the judge that influenced him to get into more trouble than he should have because of his dumb choices. And so what did he do in retaliation? He went and got this old, nappy, mobile home and parked it right up against her property, right up next to the road, next to the property line where she can see it in full, full view. And when she goes to pull out of her driveway, she can't even see down the road because of this. That's what he did in retaliation. I don't know about you, but sometimes when people act like idiots, it makes me want to act like an idiot. Can I get a better amen up in here this morning? Can we be real? And, and, and that's how the world gets crazy, isn't it? That somebody starts acting crazy, it pulls the crazy out of me. I want to act crazy back. I, I want to punch back. I mean, I don't know. Is anybody? Maybe I'm just being real with you all today. And that's how we get where we get sometimes, amen? But it doesn't have to be that way, does it? Because I don't know about you, but the power of God allows those chains to be broken. That one, one foolish, sinful thing doesn't have to lead to another thing. Just because your family was crazy, just because you got dealt a crazy hand, your mama was crazy, daddy was crazy, somebody was crazy, you don't have to continue the chain. You can be a generational chain breaker. Amen? So let me give you some Bible for this. Let me give you some scriptures that support this from Corinthians chapter 4. He says, we have this treasure, talking about the Holy Spirit, in jars of clay, that's in our bodies. We are the temple now of the Holy Spirit. And it's to show this all-surpassing power from God, that it's of God and it's not from us. So he says this, we might be hard-pressed. You might be in a hard-pressed link of your life right now, but you don't have to be crushed. You might be perplexed. You might be confused right now about what God is doing or not doing, but you don't have to be in despair. You might be abandoned, you might be persecuted, but you don't have to be abandoned. You've got to remember God is with you. You might feel struck down. You might get knocked down, but you don't have to be destroyed. All because we just remember that God is with us. He loves you. He's with you. Sometimes, I'm going to be honest with you, sometimes I get up here and I can preach it better to you than I can live it out myself. I'm just being honest with you today. Sometimes we can be like that, can we? We can testify to others that God loves them. God's there for you. And inside, we're dying. Inside, we're struggling. Inside, we're fighting a battle that nobody even knows. But the goodness of God, the kindness of God is able to bring us back around. No matter where you find yourself today, no matter what you're going through today, no matter how you're feeling, I believe there's somebody here today, maybe multiple people, you may be watching online, you're fighting battles right now you've not even told anyone about. You've not even talked about them. Right now, maybe you're just praying about it, you're not telling anybody. Maybe you're feeling a a, a, a pull into some sinful things. Maybe you're feeling the weight of temptation right now. Maybe you feel the enemy. You feel that struggle right now that the enemy is trying to, to, to get you to watch some things, to, to listen to some things, to, to believe a lie. I want to tell you today that God is near, that God loves you and God can help you win that battle and fight that temptation that you don't have to give in to that. 
Romans tells us it's the goodness or the kindness of the Lord that actually is what leads us to repentance. But have you noticed it's so hard, it seems like, for people to stay on track and to finish well? We're seeing so many uh, uh, stories these days, it seems like, of more fallen leaders, fallen pastors, more and more people not finishing well. That doesn't have to be your story. Along the way, I've noticed this sometimes. I think some people just get, they get lost in the woods, don't they? I, I don't mean the W-O-O-D woods. I mean the W-O-U-L-D woods. If God would just do this, <laughs> if God would just give me a better job, if God would just do this, if he would just turn this, if he would just, if he would just, he might be up there saying, if you would just. If you would just trust me and not go pull the mobile home in front of the neighbor's driveway, give me a chance to work it out, amen? He'll fight for you, won't he? You know what I did? I, I, I got in there and researched. Did you know there's a hundred biographies in the Bible? A hundred biographies, a hundred different people in the Bible that are mentioned, their story is mentioned, particularly how they finished. You know how many of them statistically finished well? It's amazing. I'm talking about the Bible. Only about a third. Isn't that incredible? Only about a third of the hundred biographies in the Bible did the people finish well. Now listen, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm not talking about did they make it to heaven. I don't know. God's the judge. But what a tragedy it would be that even though you make it to heaven, you didn't finish well. You know what I believe? I believe God wants both. Amen? There's a little baseball story. When I, my, my son was a little kid, uh, he was playing t-ball and, uh, and uh, he played for a team called the Lug Nuts. I love those little, those little T-ball names. They played for the Lug Nuts. And, and he had a little boy on his team named Bryce Watts. And, uh, and, and, they, and we're out there, you know, they're playing out there in the field. And Bryce is out there in right field one day, and he just starts yelling, Hey! He's yelling back to the dugout, Hey! Quit eating my nachos! <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, between innings, Bryce had gone to the concession stand, got him a snack, brought it back in the dugout, but when he went back out on defense, you know, some of the kids there was hungry and couldn't help themselves. Bryce comes back in, and, they, and the coach asked him, I said, Bryce, did you come to play baseball, or did you come to eat nachos? He said, I came to do both. <laughs> Come on, God wants both for us. Amen. God wants us to, to finish well and run the race well and make it to heaven. So maybe today you're just here. Maybe you just lost that passion. Maybe you're not praying like you used to. Maybe you don't read the word like you used to. Maybe you've gotten distracted. Maybe you're, you just don't have the faith to fight those battles you used to be able to fight. Wherever you find yourself today, I want to let you know that God is here today and He wants to touch and minister strength to some of you that are struggling here today. You know, even God's own people that He brought out of slavery, the Israelites, they did not finish well in that first generation, did they? Those of you that have read your Bibles, you know that. And, and even throughout their story, they continually fell back in to idol worship. They, they didn't trust God. They fell back into to falsehood and to, and, to, and to pray of the enemy. It said that they would put these places of worship and they called them their high places. They, they'd put these places up on hilltops where everybody could see them. They would sacrifice children. They would do detestable things. They would put up all these, these terrible things and places of worship in these high places. And they angered God by what they did. Uh, it, it, it says in Psalm 78, they put God to the test. They rebelled against the Most High. 
They did not keep his statutes. They angered him with their high places. They angered him with what they had in their high places. They aroused God's jealousy with their idols. Did you, I, I, did you know you and I have high places in our life? We have things that we value highly. We have things and we have people that we put in the high places of our life. I want to ask you a question today. Who or what is in the high place of your life? Have you allowed something to get in those high places other than Jesus? Because there's two particular high places in your journey that you need to be particularly aware of. That's how you start and that's how you finish. Those are high places in your life. And as we walk it out today, I want to ask you, are you allowing who started this thing to finish it? Hebrews 12 says, we look to Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. The enemy, he knows this. He wants to sit in the high places of your life. He knows that verse. But we have to stay focused, and we can't allow that to happen. Second Corinthians says, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Remember Romans 8, 28, I said, we read that God is working through, that he is working in all things. Second Corinthians tells us that your troubles are actually working on your behalf if you'll follow Jesus. <laughs> to achieve in a, glo a glory that outweighs them all. So what do we do? We, we got to fix our eyes. To run well and to finish well, we got to fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary. What are you facing today? Can I ask you a question? What's the first thing on your mind when you wake up in the morning? Is it the troubles? Is it the problems? Is it what I've got to deal with? Or is it how good God is? They don't feel light and momentary, do they? They feel heavy. And they feel like they're going to last forever. But I want to finish today with this. When you see something in the Bible three times, you better take note. A word to the wise. If you see something in Scripture three times, that means it's a done deal. It's sealed. It's set. Jesus said three times in Revelation, he said this statement. He said, I am the Alpha and I am the Omega. I'm the Alpha and I'm the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. The Alpha and the Omega. The Alpha and the Omega. Now, that's Greek. This was interpreted from Hebrew into Greek. Those are Greek letters, Alpha and Omega. But actually, if you go to the Hebrew, one version back, those first and last letters would be Aleph, and they would be Tav. If you were reading this in Hebrew, it would say, I'm the Aleph and I'm the Tav. And every letter has a symbol. Aleph, it would sort of be like an upside down, like a V almost. You turn it up, that's how we get our letter A. But if you go to the, to the letter Tav in Hebrew, it's actually, it's actually a cross. It's actually looks like an X, and if you kind of turn it like you did the first letter, it marks the spot of our salvation. What am I trying to tell you this? That what started with bulls and rams, which was the symbol of the Aleph, ended with Jesus, our perfect sacrifice forever and ever and ever. That's why Jesus 
when he was hung, when he was dying on the cross, he said this. He said, "It is finished." Yeah. You know what that means? That means the debt's fully paid. That means the judgment has been served. And that means the victory is already won. Come on, somebody, today. <laughs> Hallelujah. When I was a kid growing up, I'm going to tell my age, I, 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 one of my heroes, one of my idols was this guy. Uh, he was a daredevil, he, and he was called Evil Knievel. Where y'all at? <laughs> y'all who remembers Evil Knievel? He, and, and, and this is what he was, and he would jump, for those of you younger, just Google him if you don't know what he, but he, he would like jump stuff on motorcycles, and that was, that was kind of his thing, and he wore this suit, and he'd be on fire, and he just, did, he was known for the world record of the most broken bones. How would you like to have that record? He, he set the world record for the most broken bones. How would you like to be his friend, call you up on the phone? Hey, who's this? Evil. Evil calling. He did a lot of amazing, crazy things. He was a showman. But in real life, he wasn't a very good man. He was not a very good person. He was a drunk. He was a womanizer. He was abusive. He was a heathen, we might call him, in every way. But a couple years before he died, he heard about Jesus. And he called up a man named Lee Strobel who wrote a book called The Case for Christ. And he, he called Lee and he said, Lee, I've heard about this man named Jesus. Is it true? i, I got to know everything about him. Is it true? Is he really the one? Is he the Savior of the world? And Evil Knievel got gloriously saved. And from what we understand, he lived the last couple of his years of his life on fire for God. And you know what he said? You know what he said before he died? He said, my only regret is this. I wish I'd done it sooner. Listen to me. The enemy knows. He didn't start your faith. He can't finish it. He knows Jesus is the author, and he wants to be the finisher. Don't let him steal your omega. Don't let him do it. Determine and decide today, I'm going to finish well. Don't you bow your heads with me today. If you would today, just... Just kind of steal your heart before the Lord. Some of you today are struggling. Some of you today, you are fighting battles. And the Holy Spirit is here today to, to minister strength and to encourage some of you that you are going to make it. You are going to get through. God's with you and He loves you some of you here though and you need to fully surrender to Jesus you need to give your life to him. you need to give him everything you need to not just make him savior but Lord if that's you today I want to pray for you right now God please give us strength and courage to receive you and to receive your love and to fix our eyes on you to put you first in everything if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, right now I want you to repeat this prayer for me if you want to do that today. If you want to give your life to Him, just say, Jesus, thank you that you loved me first. Thank you for paying for my sin. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Forgive me for my sin. Thank you for setting me free. Give me grace to walk with you for the rest of my life. Father, I pray today for those struggling, God, for those fighting battles, Lord, and we all are fighting some kind of battle. God, I pray today for strength, God. I pray today, Father, that the unction of the Holy Spirit, the wisdom and the healing of the Holy Spirit would come and touch people today, Lord. 
Minister to them, Lord, wherever they need it the most. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Today we're going to do something that uh, I believe in your seats, there in front of your seats, there's a, the communion elements today. I want to lead us in that as we close today. We do this to remember. And if you are a Christian today, if you are a born again believer, if you just prayed that prayer right there with me, I invite you today to take the family communion with us. This is receiving the Lord Jesus, symbolically receiving his life, death, and resurrection for us. And as you open that up and take that out today, this represents Jesus said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Let's eat together. Jesus, we thank you that by your stripes we are healed. Amen. By your stripes, Jesus, we are healed. Thank you, Jesus, that we are healed by what you took in your body for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's healing somebody right now. Just receive it right now. He's healing you right now. Just, just receive it right now. He's, he's healing your body right now. Jesus, thank you for what you took in our body. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. It says that after then he took the cup and he said, This is my blood which is poured out for you. Let's drink together. we thank you, we love you, we worship you, we praise you for what you did for us. We remember today all the goodness that you've put into our life, God, and that we have everything we need. Thank you for the word, thank you for the spirit, thank you for your son. Thank you, Jesus. And everybody say thank you, Jesus, today. God bless you. Thank you for your time today. prayer team come up. We thank God for that awesome word. Amen. Yeah. For those who were touched by that word, prayer warriors here at the altar. Maybe you have a, a physical problem, an emotional problem, or a spiritual dilemma. We believe the Lord can fix it. Our altars are open. Please come.
stretch our hands this way to seal these prayers. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your word and we thank you for your people. You said whatever we ask in your name, we shall receive it. You said in your word that without faith it is impossible to please you. But you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. We seek you now. We touch and agree by faith. You said wherever two or three agree upon a thing, it is established. We receive healing today of mind, body, and spirit. We pray that that spirit that has been captivated by your word will be able to perform what you have placed in each of our hearts. We thank you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give God a hand praise. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. We love you. And we are just so grateful for that word. God bless you for being obedient pastor sinners I'm going to bless you let's hold our hands up now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask to think according to the power that worketh in us Lord we delight in you and you said that you would give us the desires of our hearts allow us Father God to hold fast to that word that it will not get choked up but God that it will produce fruit and we pray that we would be able to do these three things that we will know share together Jesus God bless you have an amazing day thank you for your faithfulness